Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tariq Kishawi from the Global Health Institute in Beirut. Um, we at, at the Institute, in partnership with Swiss, Swiss Cross Foundation, have established the Center for Research and Education in the Ecology of War, which, um, which aims to produce contextualized and evidence-based research about the biggest health challenges facing our region, particularly in conflict settings. Uh, with the outbreak of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen uh, huge interest from humanitarian actors and uh, global health actors uh, in, in addressing COVID in, uh, in, in all over the world. However, the particular challenges um, of conflict settings warrant their own and uh, particular response. Um, so the, the main questions we will be discussing during our webinar today is uh, what are the what can global health actors do to number one mitigate the harm that COVID-19 will have in conflict settings in the short to medium term and number two lay the groundwork for a COVID-19 strategy that is contextualized to meet the challenge in conflict settings. Some other questions to consider are what does social distancing even mean in a refugee camp? How can health infrastructure that has been decimated by years of war, conflict, foreign occupation, and instability handle such a complex challenge? And finally, we'd like to hear from our panelists, what are the, their top five recommendations for global health actors in conflict areas? Their insights will be valuable in getting the global health community to start addressing the particular challenges of stopping COVID-19 spreading in conflict settings which can lead to disastrous uh, consequences. Um, I, I'd just like to take the time now to thank uh, our partners at Swiss Cross uh, and to thank our, our esteemed panelists. We're honored to have them with us uh, and the organizations that, that, that they represent, uh, including the ICRC, uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, the American University of Beirut, and the Center for, <clears throat> for Humanitarian Negotiation. Uh, we will begin today with uh, Dr. Claude Broderline from the Center of Competence on, Humanita uh, on Humanitarian Negotiation. Uh, he is the director of CCHN, uh, which is a joint ICRC World Food Program, UNHCR, MSF, and Dever based in Geneva, Switzerland. He conducts regular field research on frontline negotiation and is the main actor of the CCHN field manual on frontline humanitarian negotiation. Mr. Bruderlein has led several negotiation processes with the ICRC and with the UN as special advisor to the Secretary General. He worked particularly on humanitarian access in Afghanistan, occupied Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Myanmar, North Korea, South Sudan, and Yemen. Mr. Bruderlein currently acts as a strategic advisor to the president of the ICRC and holds faculty, and holds faculty appointments at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where he teaches strategic planning and negotiation strategies in crisis environments. Before I pass along the mic to Dr. Claude, I just wanted to point out that following the, the panelists' uh, interventions, we will have a 15 to 20 minute Q&A where uh, attendees um, can, uh, can, ask, can direct questions to the panelists. Dr. Dr. Claude, the, the floor is yours, go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank you for this invitation and uh, in particular for the AUB Global Health Institute as well as the Center for Research and Education in the Ecology of, of War. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and to, um, to engage with such a distinguished panel and audience. Um, I'd like to start by saying that one of the main challenge, I mean, in addition to um, the, the ongoing conflict situation, and we're thinking more precisely what's going on in Yemen, and the additional challenge that the pandemic is bringing and will continue to bring for the months to come, um, one of the challenges at a professional level, it seems that it's difficult for the humanitarian organization and professional to figure out how to address the pandemic. Because the pandemic is not simply, um, you know, an ongoing uh, catastrophe as we have with armed con conflict, you know. 
um, where we have some kind of a distance. We are part of the pandemic. Um, humanitarian professionals are being confined. They are potentially super spreader of the pandemic. And we don't have this habit of being part of the problem where we see us part of the solution. It's also different from a natural disaster, like an earthquake that you often need to adapt your response to in a conflict zone because it's ongoing, it's spreading, it's, uh, it's expanding. It's a natural disaster that keeps going and on and on and brings a lot of uncertainty in, some, in terms of planning. And it questions the natural divisions of labor between agencies. So moving into this, uh, this situation requires a rethinking of, um, of the strategic orientation of humanitarian response. And, and more faster we enter into this rethinking, the better we'll be suited to respond to the pandemic. So what I'd like to do here is to share my screen or you're, you're turning the PowerPoint, I can see, is that right? I uh, no, no uh, we, we prefer if you, sh you, you share from your, your side, if that's yeah, possible. Actually, I cannot share the screen currently because I'm not host. You have to transfer the host to me for that I can share. Okay, I'm not host, I will share. This just allow me to share so I will be here I share please preference I see that I will click here um, okay so do you see my screen you should make a sign do you see my screen I guess you don't so let me just check again. Um, okay, and if I can share now, let me see, continue. Um, here, share. Now, do you see it? Oh, that's good. You know, it's always a bit of a struggle to get this technology working. Actually, this is why I got a white beard, you know, thanks to technology, so. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do here is to uh, bring you to the thinking we have now in terms of negotiation and humanitarian negotiation, as well as uh, looking into the response to the pandemic. The first question is, what is our role in the response to the pandemic? And integrate the notion that the responsibility is for everyone, not a particular agency, not a particular system, but we know a pandemic like COVID-19 is everybody's responsibility. People, community, government, organization, and it's only because we work collectively, and that's a thing humanitarian have had a lot of difficulties to, uh, to deal with, because we work collectively, we can have a success. While humanitarianism has distinguished itself as being a self-contained space for neutrality, independence, um, impartiality, and some isolation from the political, from the security, from the development angle. So the pandemic represents a major challenge. In that context, it must be part of a national plan. National plan in a conflict zone often imply the perception of a taken side to the conflict because you're part of a national plan. And how do you deal with areas of the countries which are not under the control of the government but rather the control of opposition groups. Are they part of the national plan and how quickly it can be politicized? It has to be in the form of science, science of public health, demography, epidemiology, and so on. And it does also risk to become political as we're trying to bring science and we see this in some contexts, including in the US. And it, we need to reassert continuously the important role of public authorities in the response to a pandemic. So from a traditional area where in conflict zone, humanitarian will try to isolate themselves from public authorities, national plan and collective approach, the, the, the pandemic uh, asked them to change their angle. So the key strategic priorities for humanitarian response and dealing with the vulnerable groups in a conflict zone is first to develop a re response strategy. The old way of doing things will not be 
the most effective one in terms of response to a pandemic. Uh, the spreading of a pandemic requires that we not only look at the, the vulnerable um, sick people, those who are like wounded or turned sick because of, of the pandemic, but to look into the health consequences of the disease, not only in terms of health, but also in terms of what have been the, 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 the impact on health infrastructure and how we can mitigate the impact of the economy of the functioning of society. So the, the strict traditional human response is quickly being overrun by the impact of the pandemic and humanitarian needs to adapt their response. A critical point also, humanitarian organization needs to redistribute capability toward local authorities. The pandemic is not the disease. The pandemic is linked to the behavior of the population dealing with the virus. If the population is able to change some of these behaviors, we will see the spreading uh, diminishing. If the population is not able to, and we mentioned refugee camp, for example, if the public is not able to, to change their behaviors, we'll see an aggravation of the pandemic. So the importance of working with communities, with people and find ways of um, getting this uh, reproduction number down, limiting the spreading of the pandemic and uh, sustaining health infrastructure. In that context, the word partnership with private, public, charitable actors at the local level is fundamental because it's the issue of trust that matters here. Um, population affected by a pandemic, they are already affected by conflict, already deprived from a lot of resources for their survival, will not trust initiatives coming from outside, especially if can they be perceived as carrier themselves of the virus and we've seen that in many contexts where human organizations are facing increased insecurity linked to this perception. Therefore, the importance of developing partnership and working with the organization. So how it comes down to, first of all, is that we need to develop a whole of society approach. Humanitarian development security needs to be looked at through the natural divide that we've been working with so far. We need to support local and national authority and understand the critical interdependence between these planning of operation between health, food, uh, you know, water, sanitation, migration, protection, and so on. We need to be ethical and strategic. First, to see that the public health agenda may not converge necessarily with the humanitarian agenda. Public health is driven by rules and methods that are aiming for whole of society approach, a public health of the population, why the humanitarian are looking at impartiality and dealing with the most vulnerable. So we need to understand this, this point of tension. We need to recognize the importance of infrastructure and societal needs, as well as be able to communicate about the relevance of humanitarian principle in the response to the pandemic. And finally, in where humanitarian are good at, we need to regain control over the crisis environment. Now, when we see humanitarian professionals confined, you know, in their home, uh, not, not able to come out, um, we do wonder what's their role, you know? So um, it's important that human organizations find ways uh, to protect their staff and do the proper duty of care, but also fulfill their mission and find the right, the, the, the right risk management aspect you know, if you're ready to send your staff to a battle zone where they may suffer, you know, life injury and, you know, and death, um, it's kind of strange that they are not con confined because of the much lower risk we have linked to the pandemic. And in that case, we need to weigh the risk and benefit for beneficiary and staff and take, you know, serious uh, measures to get this professional staff back in the field. And doing so, avoid becoming a spreader. Because humanitarian professionals and organizations are par excellence a potential super spreader um, as they move from community to community. So how to bring test, tracing capabilities, isolation into place. 
The role of you as a negotiator in that context is to seriously engage with public health authorities wherever they are, whatever their level, local, provincial, national, promote the respect of human and principle while knowing that the response to the pandemic is not necessarily a humanitarian operation, address the potential friction between humanitarian imperatives and public health policies, and navigate the, the tension between these two. And I will summarize what type of tension we may see, and I'll stop. First, you know, there is value-based tension. There is what we call political tension. Now, the value of humanitarian intervention is its humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. This is well known, but the public health is about efficiency, efficiency of the response. It's about equity. We need to engage to protect the health of all, not the health of few, the most vulnerable, but to find ways to protect the health of population as a whole. And it's not about neutrality and independence. On contrary, we said it's about collective intervention. Otherwise, we cannot maintain um, proper service and contain the spreading. It's about integrating action into a larger plan. And to do so, we need to connect. Connect the value of public health and connect the value of humanitarian action. Professional standards need, need to be looked at. And you know, for humanitarian, having access to the population, the autonomy of programming, accountability to beneficiaries are very important tools and methods. But for public health response, we want to limit exposure of population to external actor. We want government control over tools and methods, and we want accountability to public authorities first. And that can require a new consensus building effort. You cannot operate on a territory or with, within a community without having properly engaged with these authorities to find how you will operate as a way of you know, mitigating the risk of spreading the virus. And ultimately, technically, you want to protect your staff too. The duty of care is very important. You want also to protect the autonomy of resources. But in the case of a public health campaign against uh, the pandemic, priority allocation will need to take place. You cannot give PPE equipment to all the humanitarians. Well, in hospitals or clinics, you do not have access or not sufficient access to such capabilities. It needs to be feasible under the circumstances. This is not an option. It has to take place. And therefore, you need to put the resources where most needs are. And then back again to this collective responsibility. We need to be part of this collective response and to do so and to be able to contribute to this, we need to have the expertise. And many of the humanitarian organization are not necessarily equipped with the public health expertise. They may be running you know, hospitals and, and you know, war surgery, but it's different running a public health campaign. And for organization to enter into proper relationship with academic center like AUB and others, is fundamental to get educated, to seek out the expertise, and develop a proper programming in terms of public health response. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Claude. Uh, we will move on to uh, Dr. Tony Abu Fayyad. Uh, Dr. Abu Fayyad is a microbiologist with expertise the detection and characterization of bacterial pathogens and their resistance. He completed his doctoral thesis on combining chemical synthesis and biosynthesis to generate novel antibiotics at the University of St. Andrews in the United Kingdom, followed by postdoctoral studies at Helmholtz Institute for Pharmaceutical Research in Saarland, Germany. Currently, he manages his laboratory at the Department of Experimental Pathology, Immunology, and Microbiology at the Faculty of Medicine in the American University of Beirut. His research interests are in the field of antibacterial resistance in conflict regions and drug discovery, primarily focusing on no novel antibacterial agents. Dr. Abu Fayyad has two patent applications for novel antibiotics. In addition, Dr. Abu Fayyad is an assistant professor at the American University of Beirut and publishes regularly in peer-reviewed journals, including topics related to antimicrobial resistance. Dr. Abu Fayyad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tare, uh, for this kind introduction and for the opportunity to be here with your panelists. Um, I'm not going to drag too long, and I'm going to continue from where um, uh, Dr. Claude um, uh, stopped. 
specifically when uh, when he mentioned the point that uh, panelists, uh, sorry, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, health workers and the uh, the humanitarians, you cannot really give them PPE if the uh, hospitals in conflict regions and in in, uh, in countries suffering from conflict, um, their hospitals and their labs are lacking PPEs for their tests. Now, um, usually conflict zones are a worry for us when it comes to infection. Um, I'm gonna uh, demonstrate for you uh, one or two of the main reasons why, which also falls where uh, our research, research interest lies. Um, Tarek, would I be able to share the screen uh, from my, am I the host now? I, 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 can, you, can you try sharing the screen without me transferring host to you? Yes. It doesn't work. It doesn't. And now, can you try again? Still not. One last time. I think you can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. All right, good. So one of the reasons why for us um, conflict zones and uh, and uh, um, war regions are a bit um, scary um, is antimicrobial resistance and infection in general. How come if you add to it a pandemic outbreak, which is hitting uh, globally every single country in every corner of the world. Now, if you look at this schematic uh, timeline, um, if you notice that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify it so that the audience can understand a bit and I'm going to state what the acronyms are. AMR stands for antimicrobial resistance and uh, XDR stands for extensively drug resistant bacteria. MDR stands for multi-drug resistant and PDR stands for pan-drug resistant. And pan-drug means game over with the infection. That means this is an infection that has no antibiotics that can be used in the clinics to cure that infection. And if you notice, the first report of an MDR infection was during the 1970 um, war, uh, the Vietnamese war. Then in 1985, we noticed the first XDR infection emerging. And then in 2007, we noticed the PDR of the pan drug resistant, the first pan drug resistant infection emerging. And if we would add these timelines, they would fall straight on where we had wars and conflicts, and they originated from areas where conflict did exist. Um, this is one of the worries we have because conflict do play a major role in infection and conflict uh, causes lack of hygiene, co conflict causes high exposure to heavy metals that in turn induces antimicrobial resistance and causes chaos as well, causes overwhelmed hospitals, overwhelmed hospital staff and, uh, and clinicians and surgeons as well. And this causes also um, what you call a dirty surgery. So it's done with the with the minimum requirements for a surgery. And sometimes even where they're done, they're not even surgery rooms. And, and this, this is one of the reasons why antimicrobial resistance by itself, without adding to it COVID in conflict regions is, is a very important matter. And then adding to it COVID um, brings us to, to two very important points, which are um, um, the lack of labs that uh, certain countries can, uh, can test. Uh, so for example, uh, if you look at the Worldometer, which is tracking all the um, numbers of coronavirus or COVID-19 infections around the world, you would notice that two uh, countries are missing. And these two countries are Syria and Yemen. And Syria and Yemen, at the moment, they're having um, outbreaks, but we don't know how many tests they're running. We don't know if they're running any tests. We don't know how many people are losing their lives because of COVID or even because of other infections. Um, Iraq, for example, is managing to test although the number of tests is not high enough. Um, they need more tests, but Iraq is doing a better job than others. But looking at certain labs that do lack the, uh, in certain countries that lack the equipment, um, as, as Dr. Claude was saying, they lack PPE. Uh, so the humanitarians cannot distribute the help and the, the aid they need. The, their hospital staff, they lack PPE, so they cannot really uh, operate properly and this would put them at a very high risk. Um, in addition, um, having um, being susceptible to one type of infection like COVID would put you at, at a great risk uh, to be susceptible for other infections. So you'd be suffering from what is called as a uh, dual infection or a co-infection, and this could cause um, severe complications. Um, basically, um, 
what we really hope for is to try and learn the best from what's going on at the moment and try to help these countries that are uh, going um, in, in conflict to actually try and um, um, overcome these uh, difficult times and try to help them even remotely if we can by testing in other places or in other countries, having countries that have capabilities, that would be very useful. Um, I'm just going to finish up with a, a point that I missed to start with, that um, uh, the region that we are in, so Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, uh, Iraq, uh, Libya, all this Middle East, North Africa is a, is a region that is suffering from conflict uh, and uh, ongoing wars over time, and this is causing a very uh, high rise in, uh, in resistance and in infection overall, not only as, uh, as uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, and uh, we, can, uh, we can see that uh, uh, quite a lot of the, um, what we call a first report of a specific infection or a, or a certain infection can be actually uh, uh, seen by, uh, in, in our regions. So for example, uh, the, the first report of NDM1 was reported in India by an Iraqi patient who was transported during the war uh, in Iraq to India and uh, this enzyme is actually now causing a lot of problems because it actually deactivates one of the last resort antibiotics that we use, which are known as carbapenems. Um, how do we add all of this to COVID? Um, COVID obviously makes this even more difficult for certain countries that are suffering from conflict, like Syria, like Yemen, like Iraq, um, like Libya, and, and, and uh, occupied territories as well. Um, but um, what, what basically uh, makes it also more challenging is that these countries originally lacked the capabilities and the skills to be able to um, uh, characterize the infection uh, of COVID because the need of a real-time PCR machine, uh, which would be considered in these countries as an expensive device. If you would go to the Western countries, a real-time PCR machine could be a standard machine, which is found in every lab. But if you would come and look at our region, you would discover that a real-time PCR machine is not a device that is found in, in, in every lab or in, in every hospital, even in, in some countries, they lack the device uh, uh, to start with. So um, having a high number of infection in the first place, adding to it a pandemic outbreak of COVID-19, um, like we're witnessing at the moment, puts these countries at greater risk. And uh, this is where the humanitarian part and the, uh, the social science would come to aid the microbiologists to actually try and help and support these countries. And uh, this is where I'm going to uh, end my uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Abu Fayyad. Uh, we'll move on now to Dr. Habib al-Rahman Qasim. Uh, Dr. Habib al-Rahman Qasim is the chief of the Department of Pediatric Burn Care Surgery at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health in Kabul, Afghanistan. He is specialized in pediatric surgery, burn care, plastic and, and plastic and reconstructive surgery. He is a member of the European Club of Pedi Pediatric Burns and has received the prestigious Zon Janjakovic Janjakovic Prize. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Prize at the ECPB World Congress for Pediatric Burns in Birmingham in the United Kingdom in 2017. Uh, Dr. Qasim, I'll Pass the floor along to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the distinguished guests and also you to give, for giving me this opportunity to join you. Um, as I have heard the two presentation of the distinguished uh, guests, uh, mine is a little different because I'm already living in a conflict area. But I cannot share from here my presentation with you. If it is possible, you can share from there. Yes, yes, I'll pull it. Is 
yes, yes, it's possible. I Uh, would you would you like to start the presentation while I while I pull it up for the screen share? Yes, if you can uh, screen share my presentation. If it is needed, otherwise I will just present it from my side. Yes, please start presenting from your side, and uh, I'll. Yes, so uh, my presentation is um, about Afghanistan and I have started from the background of Afghanistan. Afghanistan, a country in war since 1970s, invaded twice by USSR and USA. This war caused destruction and devastation, around 2 million dead, more than 6 million refugees. Imagine the situation of basic services, including health in such circumstances. But life still need to move on. How was the daily life on, on the arrival of COVID-19 in Afghanistan? If we don't neglect and think about daily life in deep, it seemed the life here was like living in a graveyard. But after when we go out of homes, the streets and roads were looking as usual. Markets were crowded, bazaars and roads unplanned, traffic jams, and people were busy in their routines. So basic and simple life. But as a whole, one thing what we could see on the, everyone's face was disappointment and lack of hopes. Survival in such circumstances itself is a good fortune. The occurrence of COVID-19 in such circumstances is as painful as sprinkling salt on the people's wounds. It compounds the problem that societies and conflict faces on a day-to-day -day basis. The challenge on the arrival of COVID, it was deteriorated security, unstable politics that we had already, financial and economical situation of the country, Poverty were around uh, more than 50% of population was below than the line of poverty. Illiteracy, social and customary belief, lack of confidence in country health system, and cooperative media, joint family system where a large number of family members live together. No respect of the people to lock down. The spread and flow of the virus in my country, as Afghanistan shares a long border with Iran, the epicenter of the virus in the region, with at least four border crossing points. We also share border with our other countries with reported COVID-19 cases, and we receive passengers from uh, around the world through our four international airports. The inflow of Afghans coming from Iran has been the main concern and the biggest challenge as many of them, of the returnees, were likely in contact with cases of COVID-19 while living in Iran and even traveling to cross the border. More than 250,000 persons have returned to Afghanistan from Iran, starting from January 27 up to March 23. Although screening teams are deployed in all entry points to do the thermal screening of all passengers entering and instruct them to avoid close contact with others for a period of 14 days, the sheer number of turns has sometimes overwhelmed their capacity to have a meaningful intervention. Con currently, Afghanistan is looking in the peak phase and it will take months contain cluster of local transmission looking 
to the society and the capacity of health facilities regarding 2019, the real number of might be much more than the officially announced around 18,000. The current capacity for responding to this outbreak needs to be augmented in all the health facilities of the country for the control of the diseases and mitigation mortality. According to the community structure and to the general understanding of the people, a special isolated unit should be opened in each national and provincial hospital where a serious suspected person will be admitted until the results and less sick patients receive guidance for home isolation of medical treatment needed and reduce the load on the COVID-19 treatment center and reduce further spread of the virus. The goal, objective, and suggestions that have the overall goal of the plan is to protect future people from the spread of coronavirus epidemic and limit its devastating consequences by providing a policy framework for national and subnational stakeholders to build capacities to prevent, detect, and respond to the health emergency due to COVID-19. But in circumstances like in Afghanistan, how it can be possible where early case finding is difficult and the people even cover their diseases, they don't report. Instead of early isolation of confirmed cases and effective management of the of infected person, they were kept in quarantine like in prison with no healthy food and necessary care. Lack of infection prevention, PPE kits and specific control measure in health facilities were not available. Nor paying attention for health awareness and risk of communication, distrust ineffective coordination and lack of resources, not effective and late logistic support for emergency response. Based on duration in short term, our struggle were not effective. Mid term and long term followed sooner by each other, according to my opinion. In the short term, we were not effectively prepared due to the challenges mentioned above and the virus spread widely in the country. All the health facilities were not equipped and were not, and were not ready to receive the infected person by virus. And the people also blindly visited the hospital to find the good place and better treatment that causes a widespread of the virus among the medical professional a huge number of them suffer, including Minister of Public Health himself. And unfortunately, we have lost many of our colleagues in the last two months. It caused the phobia of COVID-19 unnecessarily spread much faster than the diseases itself among the professionals. Although lab capacities to respond to early diagnosis is still very low, using available financial and other resources for advertisement and charge instead of preparedness of medical staff. The medium term, long term, or will say better the current situation that we are establishing a central command center on the national level, which contribute in the development of robust national health security agenda for all hazards and pandemic preparedness framework for the country, which is involving all the national and provincial hospital, if possible, district level hospital in term of capacity in the treatment of COVID-19, especially the, their department of internal medicine, anesthesia, reanimation. We will take adv advantages of their talent and experience. Let the organization to make a team according to needs or, and sufficiency in this system a team will work together under the leadership of a qualified person, which is already known. The salary being used for the new personnel and new hospital should be used as allowance to the, the personnel of this hospital. Development of a system, systemic structure and hospital will ensure timely preparedness and response, capacity development and evolving organizational reform, including 
the, or the re, re, reorganization of health security establishment at national and provincial level, sustainability of ongoing efforts and institutionalizing efforts, especially in infection prevention, or leave case finding, treatment capacities, and health promotion activities, including a learning culture in the organizational response to COVID-19 to further strengthen Afghanistan's capacity to respond effectively to emerging threats. Strengthening and reform of the organizational structure and coordination mechanism to ensure the maximum level of preparedness over time and effectively respond to all hazards, including COVID-19 emergencies, develop robust surveillance and response structure through Afghanistan, throughout Afghanistan, ensuring compliance with international health regulations. And the, my suggestions that I have for the triage, um, for the moment the triage is doing in the every hospital in the entrance, but according to my opinion, as tests are not enough available in the country, lockdown was not uh, respected, social distance and mask wearing or neglected by the people. So every patient should be considered as COVID-19 positive. In this case, what will be the benefit of the separation of patient with acute respiratory tract infection symptoms at the entry points of the hospital brought by family who will go back and be mixed in the society? Allocation of separate OPD and screening unit for aged patients or who have comorbidity. comorbidity. In addition, OPD and primary health care facilities will be done in open air at the provinces where the weather condition is friendly. Allocation of separate place for different patients in, in inpatient ward for ARI cases in hospital and health facilities within with inpatient capacity. Allocation of isolation ward for confirmed COVID-19 serious cases at the national and provincial level will equip wards. Applying standard precaution for all patients, they, they should be everywhere. It, applying uh, additional precaution measures, uh, they are also nouns and administrative control to ensure educate health personnel, focal points, procedure, equipment, and supplies are available and use properly administrative control measure will be applied all by basic primary health services and essential primary health services. Implementing partners receive orientation and instruction to implement the IPC at their health facilities. The objectives, effective and timely logistic support to ensure effective logistic support, the following activities are planned, which will be lead, led by operation and logistic committee. Conduct an assessment of the availability of supplies, equipment, PPE, laboratory diagnostic, potential needs, including identification of sources. Ensure availability of PPE and the other equipment at key designated sites and hospital. Estimate the quantity of the necessary medication and other material required and ensure proper supply chain arrangement, tariff and tax reduction recommendations. Coordinate and development of provincial operation plan. Ensure sufficient quantity of decontamination solution, all provinces to devise respective decontamination plans under community hygiene region and share the same. Contingency planning for different scenario for the evaluation of diseases and its population effects. Um, or the, my last, uh, uh, slide is, are we following a disaster in Afghanistan for the purpose of the preparedness and logistic planning? WHO has predicted three different scenarios in, as in below. 
the uh, scenario one was low transmission with total 40,000 positive cases, uh, MOPH predicted based on China, Hubei province COVID-19 spread. And the second scenario was moderate uh, transmission with total 190,000 positive cases, recent uh, prediction based on global literature for COVID-19. And scenario three was the high transmission with total 7, 143,000 hospitalized cases. Looking to the lockdown respect, mask wearing, keeping social distance, view of Kabul and other cities which are jam packed with vehicles during pre eat days for shopping. Ministry of Public Health was issuing warning of widespread transmission of coronavirus, but there is a little cooperation from the people in more considering the deep social ties, large families, extreme poverty, large number of daily workers, large proportion of young population, strong misbeliefs, expected failure to enforce preventive measures and neglecting the death seem to be coming the only option can be expected is a herd immunity. Hope everyone get it in coming weeks with no more mortality that we have already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Qasim, very much. Uh, we'll move on to our next, um, next panelist, uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdelrahman. Uh, is a grad, has graduated as a medical doctor from Adan University in Yemen in 2001. He continued his clinical training and medical work in Khartoum, Sudan between 2002 and 2004. In 2012, he obtained a master's in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in, the, in London, um, in the United Kingdom. And he joined uh, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, back in 2005. Since then, he has worked as a field doctor in Darfur, in Sudan, in Somalia, in Kenya, and in Liberia. Then he uh, assumed the position of medical coordinator in Sierra, Sierra Leone, Pakistan, and Libya. Since 2014, he is the deputy coordinator of operation for MSF OCB, which is based in Brussels. Uh, Dr. Abdel Rahman, I leave the floor to you. And uh, please let me know if you need me to pull up your presentation or if you have it on hand. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman, you're muted, uh, so we can't hear you. Now, now I've unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. So let's see if it uh, if it work. So uh, okay. so, so do you see my screen? Hello. Uh, no, we don't. We no. don't see it yet. Uh, so okay. Um, you have to click on the, the small window and then click share on the bottom right corner. Yes, so, it's it's starting to share. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes, good. We can see it now. Okay, good. So, yeah, basically, I will just try to uh, share a bit of uh, quick experiences and perspective from an MSF perspective. Uh, I will try to go quickly and then maybe click a bit on some of the connecting value that, uh, that Dr. Claude spoke also about. Uh, so I will go just uh, quickly in, in terms of as a humanitarian actor now. I mean, uh, despite that the, the conflict had had, uh, had a lot of pressure on the social texture and, and the trust was mentioned a lot uh, for community engagement to get people understanding the disease and, and move with you on it. But that would be, uh, we, we noticed that would be hardly uh, there in a lot of conflict setting where, where this is a bit lost, uh, including a loss of trust with some uh, clinical care providers. But I want to focus here that one, what we see in the last decade in terms of, uh, especially for us as a medical humanitarian actor is the, is the erosion of the humanitarian principle that Dr. Claude has brought 
and that is intention with public health. But also we see that also the, the, the blurring of the line uh, in a lot of um, in a lot of conflict setting uh, uh, in, in Congo, for example, but in a lot of other countries, we see that uh, that there is a lot of heart and mind campaign that have been mixed uh, with the peacekeeping, and now there is some discussion of um, counterterrorism as well. So we see those all are additional complexity in conflict setting that complicate uh, a public health measure or a general uh, response. Uh, overall for humanitarian actor and non-humanitarian actor. We saw also, for example, in, in Eastern of Congo, where there is an active conflict since a decade, that there is also some militarization of the response itself. Uh, and that complicated the issue as in the case of Ebola. Uh, and, 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 uh, and then there have been always this issue uh, of tension that we have seen over the last decade between humanitarian emergency and state building. So I think that's before COVID arrival, had been always a complexity. So now what we see concretely as COVID risk on top of this, uh, I think for us, the most probable uh, important uh, uh, risk that COVID brought is additional uh, barrier to care that we see in conflict setting already. If we look at the pyramid of uh, care or the barrier to care, uh, pyramid, I mean, not only with the finances, the physical uh, barrier and the cultural barrier, we could see that the COVID have pushed people socioeconomic further to poverty. So, I mean, obtaining a fee for a consultation is already complicated, but physically we're in conflict setting distancing or kind of um, uh, physical barrier in terms of military check post and all those kind of things are already in a lot of context. We see that, for example, in Aden, in Yemen, there are increasing military check posts. The access to, to the city is very, is very complicated. But then with the COVID in itself, we put ourselves physical barrier to try to protect those structure. So, uh, so that's also all add. And then as mentioned by some of you, the cultural issue, I mean, the whole conspiracy around COVID have a lot changed a lot the perception of people around the disease itself. And it's a disease in, in some contexts like in Congo, RCA and elsewhere, it had been perceived as a white man disease or a rich man disease. And in the US, they were talking it as a Chinese disease. So, I mean, this whole cultural dimension, again, add, add a barrier to some specific minority and some, some group. But also want to highlight one other barrier specific or risk linked to the um, uh, conf conflict setting is that uh, and, and in COVID, we saw a lot of dependence on law enforcement actors to, in, to, to try to do uh, outbreak control. So we, we are worried and we saw some signs of opportunistic use of this to repress opponent. Uh, we see some example of that in Kenya, Uganda, but elsewhere. So this is additional risk factor that COVID has brought beyond, uh, beyond the only medical factors. And then if we focus a bit on the medical factors, I mean, uh, we, we saw that, for example, there have been a lot of focus on the on the medical care in a lot of the hospital for the very critical cases uh, that require 5%. But we notice largely that uh, the oxygen become a, a major issue. For example, in Aden, in Yemen, we are running a health center, we are running a hospital with a bed capacity of around 80 bed. But uh, the oxygen, the oxygen consumption in that facility is around 120 bottle per day. And, and that's a key struggle to try to maintain that. And that's one really of the thing that we saw as a major challenge that COVID have put for COVID and non-COVID patients that still need oxygen. So I think a lot of you mentioned the PPE and the additional supplies, but also wanted to highlight that also non-COVID related supplies. We see a lot of hospitals are running out of supplies and shutting down. Once linked to the, the first line worker and health worker being infected themselves and then they are getting outside the service and the hospital are shut or because of lack of supply. And in the lack of testing, as was shared by the colleagues also, especially from Afghanistan, that, that, that there is very few testing. So they start to assume that everyone will be COVID. So that also might inflict more fear or have some staff and hospital shut down and refuse to provide care. So we saw those also as very specific medical challenges that make the response in conflict setting a bit more complex. So facing with all that, I think then it become a sea of need uh, in context, uh, conflict uh, context. So I think what we need to see what can be done in terms of a strategy for medium and uh, for immediate medium uh, term, I think we need to have a very concrete priorities and objectives. And, and to do this, we, we in MSF, we start to use uh, frequently now this kind of three diagram, uh, three circle diagram, 
try to have some focus. So given the nature of the organization, a medical humanitarian organization, we try definitely to focus on the vulnerable group. Indeed, the pandemic requires much more public health oriented response. And we are in day to day struggling by trying to connect this to value for a medical humanitarian organization. But still we would like to have that as a guiding principle. And then within that, we need to see what actually those health needs, not particularly COVID needs, but what the health needs of those population in the COVID time. And also we want to see what is their demand, even if we cannot respond to them, at least maybe we can make uh, an advocacy or lobby for those kind of demand. But also we need also to see what actually the, in, in terms of how now to formulate all that, we need to see what are the most relevant uh, and impactful intervention. And here we start to enter into the feasibility. So ideally we would like to interact where the three circle overlap and that's how we guide our resource and priority setting. So for us in this, to try to cope with this, we, we actually pick three key objectives. So we said, okay, the COVID is there, we cannot ignore it. So we have to contribute to the outbreak. And also we have to focus on mortality reduction, contribute to reduction of mortality morbidity, but for non-COVID, we believe that this will result in much more excess mortality in a lot of the conflict setting and low resource setting in general, giving the pyramid of age, of course, and, and those kind of things. So we, we are worried more about the lack of access to non-COVID care. So that's a, another guiding principle. And indeed, a specific COVID intervention will be, to be deployed. So for the first one, we are trying at least to minimize that our hospitals and health structure become an amplifier of the infection. Uh, so we, we, we at least want to block that and not to act as a super spreader as, as also shared by a couple of the panelists before me. So, but what we don't want to stop there. We want also to be able to have an impact on the reduction of transmission in community through actual engagement with community, access to water. We also helped a lot on mass production of uh, um, mask production by local means, by provision of some supplies, by having workshops, in Lebanon, Afghanistan, Burundi, Congo, Yemen. So this is all to raise awareness, but also to provide a concrete means to limit the transmission. We also um, looked at the idea of, the, of uh, helping home-based or community isolation. One of the questions that was shared by the organizers, that what does it mean in, in, an, in, um, in an IDB setting? So indeed, I mean, if there is 10, where 10 person living in the same room, I mean, that idea of home isolation become a bit of a, a joke to some extent. But still, we believe that there are, we can help community to find their own solution uh, and need to provide them with some means, of course, hygiene kits, and some mask and some access to water, but also we need to give other idea that have been shared mainly that's coming uh, about the shielding, which have been entertained by different uh, actors. So we, we don't see it as uh, creating a camp for the healthy personnel with vulnerable condition or chronic disease, but we can look at household shielding by supporting some communities, household that they have uh, people with chronic diseases. So at least they receive some uh, some of the NFI kits that can help them stay a bit safe. And then for non-COVID, I think that's for us have been the overriding priority to try to maintain our existing hospital across the globe uh, uh, functional. And that's have been a clear challenge linked to staffing, linked to supply and linked to all those. So we had to organize ourselves to really maintain those essential care unhampered. So we installed triage and screening in all the facilities and we had to reorganize the care to make sure that we protect those services, which we believe they will have much more uh, responsibility of excess mortality in these times. So we, we also wanted to maintain preventive care, vaccination, malaria prevention and other type of prevention because we believe for medium now and long term, I mean, uh, uh, not doing those activity now can result in a massive uh, uh, consequences in the near future. And we also want to keep an eye in the community in Aden, for example, we use Yemen as an example where a lot of things exemplified on it. Uh, according to our team on ground, they, they have been uh, report and statistics from cemeteries uh, that uh, used to be receiving 10, 12, 15 burial uh, a day, a uh, couple of months ago. Uh, and now they speak about 50 and 60 burial a day. So, so there are kind of a catastrophe that is unfolding and it's not, if you don't look for it, you will not find it. And that's something about conflicts. A big, big misery can be hidden uh, in conflict setting. And then for COVID specific itself, we had to put the remaining resource also and step up and do COVID specific response. And we try to, again, use the same diameter to 
uh, select location where we put this. So we so far put 40 beds in Kinshasa DRC, around 15 beds in Cameroon, in Mosul, uh, and those all with mainly oxygen. And as we said that with, with oxygen, probably we can save a lot of people by trying to provide oxygen and that presents a challenge in itself. And we went a bit up in some context like in Yemen where there is no other actor providing that, at least in the south of Yemen. We are trying to do that plus 10 ICU beds. And in Brazil, though it's not a conflict setting, but to share an example, we're also setting a 50 bed plus uh, 12 ICU with ventilators. And those have a uh, tremendous resource has to be attached there. And we try to limit those vertical standalone COVID response because we primarily believe that in this conflict setting in particular, we have to maintain and step up responses. And, and then in conclusion, uh, to try to end with, uh, I think it's, I think we see in a lot of contexts, including the conflict, that the, that the pandemic has put a stress on the resource of a lot of countries. We saw big, big uh, power, superpower blocking supplies from each other. We, we saw a lot of misery around that. So now as this is recovering and the, actually the pandemic and the outbreak is taking a steep up now in this uh, middle income countries, lower income countries and conflict setting, we feel that there is a need, uh, an urgent need also to increase the funding, basically just to pay resources. Again, taking him an example, where the fund um, raising uh, event uh, seems to have largely failed on raising any sufficient fund to help uh, Yemen in this difficult time. Uh, we saw staff uh, are not paid. They, they are worried about their family. They don't have accommodation. So we see that the funding had direct role to supplies, human resource, and transport and logistics. Also, we used to rely on private uh, transport, and now we are relying much more on UN transport because all the private are grounded, but also there is a risk now to use military planes. And that's again in a conflict setting will again increase the complexity. So for all those, we, we believe that there is a need for those uh, to be stepped up. And then to, to finish, we need to see much more direct and service delivery oriented actors to come and help and to engage, especially in a conflict setting, where as you mentioned in the first, uh, Dr. Claude, that being part of national plan might always compromise your uh, your perception by the community. So we need to play a role in that indeed, but also we need to diversify the response and have also engagement uh, for the niche and the most uh, hard to reach people in the community to be also looked at and taken care of. And finally, we need to focus really on the population need in COVID time and not COVID the disease alone. And I finish here, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman. Uh, that was a really helpful presentation. Um, so now we have the chance uh, for the attendees who I, would, I forgot to thank in the beginning of the webinar. I'd really like to thank the attendees for, for joining us. And uh, we, we do appreciate their, their uh, input as well. Uh, so if, if, if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, so there's, there's already two questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, the, the question is, one more question regarding the mortality rate of COVID-19 in various regions in the world. For example, in India, the mortality is low compared to Italy or Spain, much less crowded places. Um, so I, I assume the question is, how, how can this be explained? that uh, possibly countries that are more crowded, that uh, have more challenges in uh, implementing social distancing measures uh, that are possibly more... Uh, we haven't seen such high cases in say, for example, India, compared to Italy or Spain, which have uh, more resources and are possibly less, less crowded. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which one of our panelists would like to take this question, so I'm going to leave it, and whoever uh, would like to can just um, just go ahead. Maybe let me try. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's important to see that there is very little yet that is known about the behavior of the virus. It's an impact on health. Um, the level of mortality, the level of morbidity, the severity of the impact, the profiling of, um, of the population and how it affects certain groups in terms of ethnicity, in terms of the social and natural environment. Um, 
we're just discovering these aspects through um, studies of the population. And incidentally, with the lockdown and the social distancing, we have less infection um, in some environments, which may slow down the discovery of the behavior of the virus. So while we have higher level of mortality or infection in some context and less in other, and it's not only, I think we need to be careful here not to generalize too much as a level of nation like India um, or entire countries for that matter, uh, it may affect um, particularly certain group in certain cities and certain communities in a very distinct way. For example, we're looking at the impact currently on native um, uh, Indian population in the US being much higher than in other uh, environment. Is it linked to comorbidity with diabetes or obesity or others? So there is very little known about this. However, what is known is that um, the virus is the same and the way it propagates is, always, is mostly influenced by social behaviors, by social distancing. Um, and also this, um, the pandemic uh, is actually much more important in terms of phenomena than the disease itself. I think it's important that we distinguish between the two, the disease and its health impact, including in terms of severity or mortality is one thing. The way it propagates is different. So um, it's important that we see in terms of the impact on the economy and society, not necessarily being a case for a health dimension, but much more of the fear of people have from the pandemic or how their behavior change. If you take the case of India, the way that has pushed an entire state to go into a lockdown and pushing millions of people on the street, of migrant workers to go back to their village, that has by itself much more impact than the disease itself. Yeah. So it's important that we keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Claude. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is directed for uh, Dr. Habib, uh, Dr. Habib al-Rahman Qasim. Um, his, the question from uh, Ahmad Didiab is, how can you reduce and what are you doing to reduce the transmission of the disease, especially with the lack of resources and no compliance? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, for the moment, uh, we cannot do it. I don't think so, because uh, I have covered myself. I have applied all the rules uh, of the uh, uh, prevention but when I'm going to my office to my hospital from home in the way I will find some police officers who will make checkup twice in the way and they have no mask and I cannot force them to, uh, to wear the mask and I give them my I, I had a mask with me and I asked him to wear this mask and after check my body but he didn't accept this is one example and the people they don't follow Thank you, Dr. Qasim. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question from uh, Dr. Potoker. Uh, he asks, <clears throat> and um, I think I'll direct this question to uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman, if he can speak on this. I lost the connection. Mm -hmm. Yes. I oh, sorry, 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 yeah. Dr. Qasim. I, I thought you had finished your answer. Please go ahead. And other all the rules, the government, they cannot force to the people. For example, in Europe, they applied the fine. If the person has no mask or they are making gathering, they will be fine. But with the people, they have no food for them to eat, to bring to their children. So what can we take from them or what, how can we punish them? And it is not a person, a thousand, a lake, they are a million. So I think the controlling of this uh, spread of uh, COVID in my country, it is not possible for the government and for anyone other. It will spread, it will, every one of us will suffer. Thank you, Dr. Qasim. I, I, hope, um, I hope that it won't spread and I hope that not too many people will suffer. Uh, but I'm going to move on to the next question from Dr. Potaker. 
uh, he, he asks that it seems, and I, I direct this question to Dr. Abdul Rahman, but if anyone else would uh, like to speak on this, uh, please do as well. Um, so the question is, it seems the, the research focus at the moment is on basic science and clinical areas. A lot was learned in Ebola after a more community level engagement was taken. Should we be promoting more medical anthropology research as it is clear without getting the understanding and agreement of the population, most efforts are likely to be less than effective. Dr. Abdurrahman, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I mean, hundred, absolutely, absolutely, 100% agree. I think we, 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 we learned few, we learned a lot of lessons, but still, yeah, indeed, that, that, uh, that anthropology component part have, been, have not been really uh, looked at uh, seriously and not have been invested a lot in. I think we have learned a lot of lessons in the Ebola response. And more, more recently, the, the, the current Ebola response in the conflict setting in, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Congo lasted two years. And, and during these two years, uh, one of the main one of the main problem we saw we got even one of our uh, health center one of our treatment health center being burned down so the, the very people that you want to help they have very very different perception because we were playing that uh, part of the role in the national plans, like uh, we were tasked to do the prison charge, so which is to do the curative care in a center, but without engaging with the community, asking and the design of the center. I mean, I mean, for them at one stage, it was that this is a center where their loved ones come inside and then when they die, they are taken away from them and they are burned or they are not even given back. And I think we learned from the, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the Western African one, when then they have been involved on the, to do safe perils and training on safe perils rather than enforcing scientifically what we think is correct to handle peril alone. So I think we, we have learned very concrete uh, lessons that engaging the community is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, even this public health measure, however, you want to enforce it, people find the, their way around it. Even with the thermoflash and all this kind of thing, we see people taking antipyretics before getting into the planes, before crossing a check post. So I think we need to invest much more to understand the perception of a disease and then try to adapt with the science, adapt the measure according to the understanding of the community so the community can accompany that because without that engagement of community, uh, little will be done. And, and, and very few progress and slow progress will be achieved. So absolutely, um, it's very important. Great, great, thank you. There, there's a question uh, directed Sorry. to both. Sorry. Uh, May I add, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad, regarding the previous point? Please do. Um, I am tend to slightly disagree with, uh, with Dr. Ahmad and, and uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, Tom, for that, uh, uh, point because I think and maybe Dr. Claude can can uh, can help me on this. We know we back when Ebola outbreak took place, we know a bit more about Ebola than what compared to what we know about the COVID-19 strains that are circulating at the moment. And we I don't think we can really compare the response to uh, Ebola compared to the response in, in, uh, that we're currently uh, witnessing in COVID-19 because of the uh, a vast gap in literature knowledge and, and, and data knowledge about the viruses themselves. And I think um, we need to understand a little bit more about the, the basic science and how the virus beh behaves, um, be it on surfaces, be it in humans, be it in labs, uh, be it in, uh, in, um, in uh, any environment that the virus could exist and could live in, so that we can, yes, um, engage everybody else. Obviously, everybody's effort is needed in a pandemic, no matter what, uh, what field you are in, but comparing the um, response to COVID uh, versus the response to Ebola is slightly unfair uh, because the information we know about COVID is negligible compared to the information we knew about the Ebola when Ebola took place. Yeah. If I, I can wrong? just yeah. No, I can just clarify one thing. Just, uh, just I, I was trying to compare to the Ebola itself, the importance that what the what the anthropology brought into the Ebola itself. So not 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 directly comparing the COVID to the Ebola. I'm saying that when we 
didn't use, we, we, we learned the lesson quite hard lessons. And when we adapt our approach with community engagement, trying to involve families in burials uh, uh, and trying to involve families in the design of the Ebola treatment centers and try to, uh, with science, try to organize visits uh, with some distancing, even in the Ebola setting, there we saw the big difference in terms of um, uh, compliance of the community, understanding of the community. So comparing within the Ebola, when we did not take the community understanding on board and with the community understanding within the Ebola response, we saw a big difference. Um, uh, okay. so, so within within that, and we think in general, a lot of this could be transferred and applicable. So engaging the community in COVID care would be helpful. It's not to apply the same measure of Ebola directly. Great, uh, thank you. And uh, I think we'll have time for two more questions. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions into one so that we can get the, the most in. Um, so the, uh, the question is, uh, COVID-19 uh, has been talked about as a possible opportunity for uh, peace building around the world uh, in terms of global health diplomacy and the uh, UN initiative calling for a global ceasefire. Uh, can Dr. Claude Broderlein uh, comment on this particularly? W what's your opinion? Is there an opportunity for peace or is it endangering the medical and humanitarian interventions uh, that are uh, currently existing? And I'd like to tag on a question onto this. Is there any specific relevance to international human rights law and can it be used to protect uh, gener uh, populations, particularly in conflict settings? Dr. Claude, can you comment on the, uh, these two points? Yes, I'll be very short. I'm not particularly optimistic in the sense it's gonna help um, resolve conflict. Um, I think the COVID-19 is making things more complicated in terms of work on peace building, peacemaking, um, conflict resolution. Um, however, I'll be more uh, much more optimistic in the way it forces us to change the way we've been working. In the sense that the fact that now we have a lot more trouble traveling, moving around will uh, provide more space um, for people to work at the field level to get more responsibility and resources to undertake the programs and build trust with communities. Uh, we'll have less the attention on universal norms and we're talking about humanitarian law, human rights as being a, a whole normative system that we need to ally with um, as compared to working more at the local level, building trust with communities at the local level. So I think COVID-19 uh, brings up opportunities. It may not be the one that we're thinking about, um, but it will challenge the way. I would, I would say that in 12 months, in 24 months, we will have a hard time to recognize the way we were working before. So we should be open. Uh, we should be uh, attentive into these new new ways, but um, get ready to um, to work in a different way. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Dr. Steiger, the director of uh, uh, Swiss Cross Foundation. He'd like to ask a question uh, to the uh, panel. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Steiger. Thank you very much for uh, letting me have uh, access to this distinguished panel. First of all, I want to congratulate you because it's really tremendously interesting what you were telling about, especially if, if we get news and a kind of picture from the field. And it was great from Claude to give really a, a kind of introduction what's going to be followed through the other speakers. Um, the big elephant for me still in the room is, and as Claude mentioned, is that I mean, we are all more scared about the, the collateral damage caused by, uh, by COVID-19, to especially to our, to our conflict zones. And what is still in the room is, how do you feel, Dr. Habib, and how do you feel, Dr. Ahmed, from your experience, and Dr. Antoine, uh, in your environment, you're working in direct contact with the refugees, with the affected population. How big is your personal impact, feeling about the impact of COVID to this, uh, to this society and to this community from your personal own experience? Because we get uh, through Worldometer and all these statistical websites, 
we get information about what is published, but what is the re what we don't know here far away in Europe, for example, how does the reality for you look like in the field? Can you give us uh, a quick update uh, from your perspective? I would like to start with Dr. Habib and maybe Dr. Ahmed uh, and Dr. Antoine. Okay, Dr. Habib seems to be busy. Maybe Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Abdel Rahman can give yeah. us a short, a short okay. introduction. Yeah, I mean, I think I think as I, I was as trying to say, um, I mean, what we see in the in, in the field, I'm a bit also. I mean, I'm, I'm based currently in, in in Brussels, so I've been also impacted, uh, being uh, blocked here, so not visiting. But I'm in daily contact with our teams in the different uh, in the different uh, contexts, different countries. So, I think the current reality is that this what was a slow burning uh, outbreak. Let's say I think we were very cautious in the around the second half of March. April and and then people you know the fatigue has kicked in. I think in a lot of uh, places the fatigue has kicked in and some people while the outbreak is start to shoot up we notice that there is some fatigue on the community that we engage a lot of the community together and we were seeing a bit in the drop on the consultation in some of our facility but now this is we we don't see we saw two things we saw that the outbreak is increasing and perhaps there are some fatigue now from the from the measures and, and the applicability of those measures are, 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 are start to ease uh, at this stage. So we start now to also a bit being very busy internally because we start to feel that break in our own staff. We have now considerable amount uh, uh, that had, we blocked our capacity. So in, in terms of just conducting risk assessment for our different hospitals, if I take Congo, for example, where we have more than 100 international staff, and, and, and around 2,000 national staff. Imagine around 20% have risk factors. So we have to change their roles. So this is actually have uh, brought us to reorganize the care quite a lot. So this has been really very difficult and time time consuming at, at that stage. But also for the for the community, we notice a lot of a lot of mistrust started around that this is this is not true. And you mentioned that this is invisible and in lack of testing also it's completely invisible and with the conflict and the other priority and for some life goes as uh, as normal and this people is trying to scare them uh, from something as usual in our project in east congo where the ebola was around again some of them never saw the ebola they hear big thing big cars moving around because of something and now we start to see some parallel on term of their perception that there is something also being done to hide this and for that for example now in the field we initiated what we call digital health promotion so we are trying to use social media whatsapp and facebook's to be able to respond to rumors because we we start to notice in the local community there are very dangerous rumors circulating that can actually have medium uh, consequences for the access to care in these communities habib is back He's, he's really in the field. He can really share a bit much more tangible, I think. Yes, uh, I'm back, but I, have, I didn't hear the question because uh, we lost the electricity and now I'm online on my mobile. So uh, can you repeat the question just in a few words? Yeah, Dr. Abid, um, I, 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 want, I wonder because uh, we hear just unreliable statistics coming out of most of those conflict zones, but as a physician and scientist, of course, we are very curious, how were you personally impacted by COVID-19 in terms of how many patients in your hospital or in, in the hospitals you have a kind of oversight have died because of COVID-19 diagnosis? How did you diagnose, if, how do you know if they died about COVID-19 if you don't have enough tests? And um, what is your personal uh, professional impression about the situation in the environment you see around you? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, in my hospital, we, uh, in my, especially in my patient, we don't know about any positive patient because even screening is not possible in our hospital. There are children coming to our hospital they, they are uh, the family they bring, and we don't know about the uh, healthy carrier if the family, even the families are sick, they are using masks, and we are in contact with them, but we don't check them, and no one in the entrance of the hospital is screening them. That's why 
in the start, the second person who died in the doctor, it was in our hospital. We lost one of our doctors. And after that, uh, the, uh, in charge of our emergency department, he suffered. And next week, 10 or 11 people from emergency department, one of them was our resident doctor, he suffered. And after the third week, we had 12 surgeons suffered from COVID. They were positive. The other, they also had the, the symptoms, but uh, because of lack of uh, test and availability, and they were coming again and again for the test, so they uh, were not able, it was not possible for them to make the test and they stay at home. Just the people who, were, who had no symptoms, they were coming to the hospital and we make the shift system in our hospital. Around me, in my, where I'm living, uh, so every family, they have patients, but they covered, they don't show their patients. They are not going even for tests. And um, one thing other, they are going by themselves, making checkup of, of a CBC check in the laboratory. And when there is leukopenia and they perform the vital test, and sometimes the vital test it is coming positive, and the lab technician will say to them that you have typhoid. It was a, a big sp spread of typhoid last month in the Jalalabad and also in other cities in Afghanistan. And the people always they were saying we are suffer of typhoid. And then the Ministry of Public Health they sent a team to Nangarhar province and they took the samples and they rechecked and they found it, it is not the typhoid, it is the uh, coronavirus. So I spread, even in my family, I have, I had the patients, my brother and my daughter is, are uh, in quarantine still. It is today is the, ten, the day, day 11. And in Kabul, uh, my sister family, they are suffer. Uh, uh, three people are suffer. They are my brother, he is in serious. And also my cousin, all the families that I know, they have one, two or three patients who has symptoms. It's look like that these three people will be among these uh, two or three people who are po suffered, who, who have the symptoms. There are of these 20 or 15 person who can show the symptom. The other will be also, uh, I imagine that other people, they are also positive, but they are a healthy carrier, or maybe they are newly in contact and they will show the symptom uh, later. So the situation is like this. If in the hospital, around me, in the uh, neighbors, and in the family, situation like this. One thing other, the, according to the uh, government official announced, uh, announcement, uh, uh, the positive cases are around 18,000, but they are from not more than 50,000 tests. We have just performed a list test. Uh, uh, one survey that which was performed by Ministry of Public Health, and that survey, the healthy people were tested, and there was around 50% positive cases, or 30%, sorry for that, it was 30% or 50% positive cases. And from my village, where I'm originally from, the villagers, uh, even today I call, talk with them by telephone. Uh, when uh, they are seeing some newly uh, buried uh, or newly new tombs, they are finding the new tombs in their uh, uh, graveyard. So, and it shows that there are the mortality rate is high, but the people they don't show or they don't register their patients that they are suffered of COVID and they are died because of COVID. And most of the people, unfortunately, they join the ceremonies. And after this ceremony, of course, it will be a huge spread again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Qasim. And uh, first, I wish uh, all your family, whoever's been affected by this, I wish them a speedy recovery. Um, and uh, I hope they'll be back up on their feet uh, very soon. And um, I think, unfortunately, we th there are a couple more questions that are on the list. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up.
um, at this point. Um, I want to thank all our panelists, Dr. Abdul Rahman, Dr. Abu Fayyad, Dr. Claude Broderlein, and Dr. Qasim. Uh, your contributions were, were excellent, very um, informative, and uh, we hope that you know this can be used by the global health community to promote a more contextualized, effective um, uh, COVID response in conflict settings and in uh, you know uh, under-resourced countries uh, in general. Um, I would encourage all our attendees to stay tuned for uh, with the Global Health Institute and with our partners at Swiss Cross. Uh, to follow us on social media, to be informed whenever we'll have uh, more um, events like this. Um, you know, uh, one, I guess, silver lining of, of this pandemic is that people have become much more literate in using uh, these tools that uh, can bring people closer together despite the physical distance. Um, so please stay tuned with us, follow us on social media. Uh, to get more contextualized research and uh, knowledge and information uh, from the region, particularly uh, areas experiencing conflict. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, good luck to all and uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.